Hello, welcome to lesson three. In this lesson, we're going to construct this 3D text you see here. And in doing this, we're going to learn a lot more about arrays and how they add together and interact. And we'll also cover a lot more on expression control, how to use them to create some interesting design elements. So let's get to work. To start things out here, I've got some type that I've put into an NTSC D1 composition that's 10 seconds in length. I've made it a 3D layer. And I'm using Bauhaus. This is a nice thick font that works well for this application, but feel free to use whatever you want. Now, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is pre-compose this. Now, the reason I'm doing this will become a little more clear later on, but the short story is that this makes it a lot easier to change this type down the road. And like I said, that'll make more sense in a few minutes. Now I'm going to collapse the transformations and make this layer a 3D layer as well. Now in lesson two, we learned about arrays. Arrays are values that have multiple contents that are independent of each other, even though it is one value. I tend to think of this like a train. A train is one big object, but it has differing compartments or cars that have differing contents. They're independent of each other. They could be whatever. They could be coal and hobos and corn or whatever. But in After Effects, we'll find that these are labeled as 0, 1, and 2. And as we've been using the pick whip, we've been seeing these things that are labeled as 0 in brackets and 1 and 2. We're going to get a lot more detail about what's going on with that. So let me close this up. And let's make an expression for our 3D type here. So I'll option click on the stopwatch. I will type a left bracket and I will type some fixed values for X and Y. 360 comma 243. And for Z or Z as many of you say, I will type the word index. Remember index is equal to the layer number in the stacking order. So layer number one index is equal to one. And if I make some duplicates of this, about 15 of them or so. I'll create a camera and hit the C key to orbit around. And although it doesn't look very interesting, I guess is the word, we see a little bit of pseudo extrusion here, but there's a lot more that we need to do to dress this up. But you can kind of see where we're going with this. I'm going to do a few examples of this so we can get a really good understanding of these arrays. Now let me select all these layers and delete them. Now let me select this layer here and hit EE to show my expression. And we're going to use some different terminology here. We're going to look further into these arrays. Now these values are not modifiable. I cannot change X, Y, or, or Z. And I tend to shy away from using this method in making expressions, using fixed values. And it's just locking you into something that you might want to be able to change later on. So if I go into my X position here, and instead of using a fixed value of 360, I'm going to type the word position. And next to that, I will type zero in brackets. Also, I will go to this Y value and type position one in brackets. Now what this means is, if we look at my diagram here, this array, and any array in general, as we think of the values of 1, 2, and 3, like x, y, and z, or whatever, are labeled and referred to as 0, 1, and 2. It's just a JavaScript thing, don't worry about it. Just remember that the first value of an array is referred to by number as 0. And the second value, even though we think of it as the second value, is actually value 1. Value 3 would be value 2. And if we even had a fourth value like RGBA, fourth value would be, yes, value 3. So when we refer to a specific dimension of an array, like x in a three-value array, x would be position 0. Position 1 is the y position. So right now, this basically does the same thing as before, but the position is actually modifiable. So if I make duplicates of this, we'll see that it looks like it's being extruded a little bit. Well, that's another way of doing it. Let me show you the way I would actually do it.
I am going to type the word position, which, as you are well aware, because they keep saying it, is a three-value array. But it's an array. Don't forget that. And if I add to this 0, 0, index, what we're doing is adding two arrays together. The way arrays add together is that the first, second, and third values of one array will add sequentially to the first, second, and third values of another array. So value one of one array will get added to value one of the other array. Value two to two and three to three. They do not interfere with each other. There's no first, outer, inner, last, or anything like that. So what we're doing here is having x get added to zero, y is getting added to zero, and z is getting added to the index value. So this basically has the same effect as before. Again, we get that same kind of 3D extrusion. One more term we can learn here is the term value. Value is actually a much more flexible term than using the word position. Now position is its existing value before it executes the expression at the current frame. However, value is a much more generic term. Value is basically the same thing. Value is the existing property value in which we are using the expression. So in this case, value is equal to the position. If I use this expression in scale, value would be equal to the existing scale value. If I used it in rotation, value would be equal to the rotation value. So value is more commonly used because as we write expressions that can be repurposed in other properties, value is much more generic and doesn't lock us into just using the position term. And I tend to use value a lot more than I would just use the word position. Now let's dress up the look of this because as you've seen, as I keep making duplicates of these, it does look pretty flat and boring. So I'm going to go into my effects here and I'm going to add to this layer Something I rarely use, brightness and contrast. It's not exactly the most flexible color correction tool in the world, but it's going to do something very cool for us on this layer, and actually all the subsequent layers that we make. So if I select this layer and I hit E to show my effects, twirl this open, and go to my brightness control. I'm going to create an expression for brightness. What I'm going to do is use brightness and contrast to decrease the brightness of every duplicate that I make. So every duplicate layer is going to get a little bit darker as it moves forward in the Z axis. So if I go into this expression and I type the word index, and then I multiply this times a negative number. I'll use five. So what this is gonna do is make the brightness decrease by five every time I make a duplicate, because every time I make a duplicate, index is going to increase because the brightness default value is zero, it'll keep subtracting. Now, one thing I need to do though is because I've got a camera in layer one and this is layer two, I need to subtract two from this so that we do not end up altering the brightness on the very first layer. So again, stuff in parentheses gets calculated first, then the multiplication times negative five. And as you've seen, I always put negative numbers in parentheses just so it makes more visual sense. So right now, this brightness is set to zero because, well, I'm just that clever and it's doing exactly what I want. And if I make some duplicates and let this render, as you can see, it's starting to get a little darker as it goes back in Z space. Pretty cool. If I want to make this darkness a little more pronounced, I can go in and increase this value here. And as you see, it's getting darker and darker as it moves back in Z space. Pretty cool. So if I zoom in, we can see it looks like that. I tend to use a value right around uh, six. Six seems to work pretty well. So if I make some duplicates here, pretty nice. So now we can go in and dress this up a little bit. Usually what I do is select the very first layer, the very top layer, and go into Effect Generate Ramp and add a gradient to the front of this. And we can change this and make it maybe a blue to black gradient. 
and you can mix that back in with the original as much as you want or as little as you want. Another thing I often do is go into stylize and add find edges and I invert that and then blend it back in with the original as well. Adds a little bit of edging around the front of it. I think that looks pretty nice. First thing I'm going to do is turn off the collapse transformations switch for all of these. There's actually several reasons for this. One is because of shadow casting and the other is just because of the 3D render pipeline in After Effects. When I do what I'm about to do, which is pre-compose these, we'll actually want these uncollapsed. So if I select all these layers and go to pre-compose, I'll call this 3D pre-comp. I'll make this a 3D layer and turn on the collapse transformation switch. So this basically looks like a single 3D layer of extruded text that we can move around and looks just like that. Very cool. If I create a light for the, the scene, I'm going to use a point light and I'll set it to cast shadows. And I will also create a new solid and I'll call this floor. This will be fairly big, 3000 by 3000. I'll use a blue kind of material. We'll drop this down to the last layer, click the 3D switch, hit R to show our rotation values, and rotate this, or actually orient it, 90 degrees in the x-axis. And if we wait just a second, we'll see our scene looks like this. So now if I move this light upward in the y-axis to a spot where it'll actually cast shadows, we'll see that it's casting shadows. Now, the reason it's doing this is not because this layer is set to cast shadows. If I hit AA to show my material options, you'll notice that cast shadows is off. Because this layer is a layer with collapse transformation switch on, it's relying on the properties of the layers inside. So you'll notice that this top layer is set to cast shadows. The bottom layers are not. Now, if I had the collapse transformation switch, every single one of these layers would be relying on the inside layer. And if this were on, and all of these layers were collapsed, all 17 of these layers would be rendering shadows. And like I said, it takes a really long time if you want to do that. I'm sure it looks nice, but what I tend to do is just have the top layer cast shadows. So on the top layer, you'll notice cast shadows is on. Now I will probably want to move this a little closer to the floor and we'll create a, a fake reflection. You might want to make yourself accustomed to using the draft 3D switch which will disable lighting, shadows, and depth of field in our scene. Makes it render a lot snappier. Now to make this reflection I'm going to jump to the front view so I can take a look at where my anchor point is. So if I use my pan behind tool right here and I zoom in, what I want is to have my anchor point be right at the bottom, right down here, which is pretty well adjusted. But you'll want to double check yours because when I switch to this camera view, what I'm going to do is duplicate this layer and flip it upside down. Now I need to cheat here a little bit and set this floor to a 90% opacity so that when I duplicate this layer, and I look at its scale. I'll unlink these and set the Y scale to be a negative 100. What it's going to do is just take this layer and flip it upside down, make it look like a reflection, just like that. Now, if I turn my draft 3D switch off and I have the scene fully render, it looks like that. Very nice. Now, the other cool thing is that this scene will now work very well with OpenGL previews. So if I use my camera tool, I flip around is very quick and interacts very well with OpenGL. It doesn't look awesome, but if you're doing camera moves, this is a very cool way, very quick way to move around in your scene and track around like so. Are you digging expressions yet? I hope you are. Uh, well, let's make one more design element. So I'm going to make a new comp. We'll call this the sun rays. And inside this, I'm going to put my sunray elements. I'm going to create a new solid. This will be 300 by 900. This will be just the single ray. And we'll make this um, well, light blue. Now I'm going to pre-comp this into its own comp. I'll leave all attributes in sunrays. 
And what I'm going to do is double click this so I can adjust the anchor point. Let me tap the tilde key so I can bring this full screen and I'm gonna bring the anchor point all the way down to the bottom. I'm just holding the shift key to constrain the axis in the Y axis. Now let me close this up. What I wanna do is go inside this comp and draw a mask. So I'm gonna use the pen tool. Let's tap the tilde key again. I'm gonna start at the bottom middle. I'll go to the upper left, to the upper right, and then back down to the bottom, close this out. Tap the tilde key again. So now I've got this ray element drawn out. If I close this, we've got our ray element right here. Now I'm gonna move this up into the middle of the screen and center it. Now if I move this rotation around, you'll notice that it moves just like so. So what I need to do is make a bunch of perfectly evenly spaced duplicates of this layer. So the way I'm gonna do this is by creating a null object. I will hit Shift Command Y to get the solid setting so I can rename this controller. And to this, I will apply an expression control slider control. And I'm gonna hit return with this selected so I can rename this fan out. On the rotation of this layer, I'm gonna create an expression and I need to be able to see this fan out as well. So if I create the expression and I type index, well, at this point, if I make a bunch of duplicates, each one of these is gonna rotate by one degree as the index is equal to seven in this layer and this is seven degrees. Not very interesting, not very well spaced out and we don't have any control over them. So we need a better way to do this. I'll hit EE to show this expression again. What I'm gonna do is tie into this slider control. Now I'm going to drop this down one line and I'm going to use a variable. I'll just use n and I will pick whip the slider control. So it's going to get this numeric value and that numeric value will be equal to n from here on out in the expression. Don't forget the semicolon. Now if I multiply index times n, each layer will have its layer number multiplied by this fan out control. Great, except for one thing. Soon as I change the value of this fan out to something like 10, this first layer is gonna start moving. Now, it might not seem very obvious, but if I make a bunch of duplicates of this and I change this fan out control, this first one is already moving. If I'd like to keep this straight in the middle here. Now, the reason it's doing this is because, let me delete these first, because index is two in this case, two times this fan out control is going to equal something other than zero. If I'd like to keep the first sun ray right at zero, what I need to do is look at the index of that first sun ray. In this case, it is two. So I need to subtract two from this expression don't forget the order of operations. Multiplication is going to happen first, and this won't calculate correctly. What I need to do is put index minus two in parentheses. This first layer will be two minus two times n. Two minus two is obviously zero. Anything times zero is zero. So this first layer is gonna be right here at the middle. However, the duplicates that I make of this are going to be controllable with this fan out and it's going to start right at the middle. Now because we've pre-composed this and I have this mask inside here, I can move the points of this mask around as I see fit. Shrink this up a little bit and these will adjust accordingly. And I can keep making duplicates just like so. And I can animate this on and make a nice little fan opening up. I use this in a lot of my designs. Now you know how to do it, so I guess I'm gonna have to stop doing it. Let me hit F9 to ease that in and animate this so it opens up just like that. So this concludes volume one of the After Effects Expression Training Series. I hope you learned something. In volume two, we're gonna get a lot deeper into programming with JavaScript and our expressions. We're gonna do some really cool yet fairly complicated examples that I think you'll find really interesting. So I will see you in volume two.